The Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and your local cable provider presents Cable Reports. Join us now as Cable Reports brings you up to date on current issues facing the Commonwealth through discussions with your local legislators and other policymakers from across Virginia. From the General Assembly and the City of Richmond, I'm Woody Evans for Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association, connecting Virginians to their government. We're so pleased to have Delegate Jim LeMunion with us this morning. Good to see you, Delegate Good to see Lemunion. you, Woody. Good to be back. I understand that there are some schools in your district who've had some outstanding athletic seasons. You want to talk about them for a minute? Well, we actually mentioned this at a uh, recent town hall meeting, but I think some of the best high school athletes happen to be in the 67th district, which of course is uh, Western Fairfax and Eastern Loudoun County. And I and uh, other legislators, both in the House and Senate, have introduced uh, resolutions to uh, commend the uh, uh, baseball and tennis teams at Chantilly High and the basketball and football teams at uh, Westfield High. All, uh, that, uh, all of those teams won the state championships uh, last year and uh, we're expecting representatives of the schools actually uh, here in Richmond in the next couple of weeks and we'll bring up the resolutions and pass them while they're in the gallery. So Great. really well, looking forward to that. Congratulations to, to those schools. You, you mentioned a town hall meeting and I know you do a constituent survey uh, every year. Right. What are your constituents uh, talking to you about? Well, it's uh, uh, transportation issues uh, are, uh, are still the number one issue in Northern Virginia. Uh, I'm happy to report that we're making some progress uh, we've, uh, we've got more funding for, more, for Northern Virginia than we've ever had. And uh, the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority, uh, which is the, the regional planning commission that works in tandem with the state, uh, will be uh, rolling out their 20-year uh, uh, plan uh, later this year for solving our congestion problems in Northern Virginia. So I've been working with them a little bit behind the scenes. I'm not a member of the authority, but uh, actively watching and providing uh, input into their process. I know uh, Route 28, the Fairfax County Parkway, and I-66 are all uh, very uh, uh, important projects in, in, in your district. Sure, and 28 is uh, is a construction zone right now, so it's a little inconvenient, but it's uh, it's going to be a lot better when it's done. Uh, most of that construction is north of Route 50 up toward Dulles Airport and into uh, Loudoun County. Uh, and then I think uh, later this year and next year, we'll be seeing more construction south into Prince William County. But the idea is to get rid of all the lights uh, from 7 down to Prince William County. And then most importantly, as part of the I-66 project, a complete redesign of the 6628 intersection so that the backups stop and that people can move smoothly on and off those highways. Now, is that I-66 project a public-private partnership? That's what the, uh, what the Secretary of Transportation has negotiated. So they have uh, selected a company to uh, construct a, a wider road. And much like uh, the Beltway in, in 95, uh, the state in this case is not putting any money into it. Uh, but the money is then recouped by the, uh, by the uh, construction uh, management company in the form of a toll that will go for a number of years. Actually, I think the plan is for 50. Uh, but as we've done on the Beltway, the, the uh, travelers will always have a choice. If you want to stay in the free lane, you can. If you want to pay the toll, whatever it might be at a given moment, you can do that too. Uh, the, the principle behind this is that some people will pay the toll, and even those that stay in the free lane will have uh, a smoother ride. So uh, getting the toll price right is really key to that, and that's one of the issues I've been digging into both uh, this session and and uh, while we've been out of session to make sure that we're maximizing the use of the toll lanes by keeping the toll prices low enough and therefore improving congestion on the free lanes as well. Talk to us a little bit more about that toll at the moment. It's known as dynamic pricing, as I recall. Right, and so what happens is there's a, a fairly sophisticated computer model that the toll operator uh, uh, employs on an ongoing basis and based on traffic conditions uh, they will raise or lower the price of the toll. So if, if the road in the free lanes is more congested, uh, they will raise the price, the thought being that the value of a quicker trip is, is greater if the congestion is greater, uh, and then lower, you know, in, overnight it's, it's, uh, it's not zero, but it's, it's, uh, it's pretty low. So the question from a public policy standpoint is how well is that working? 
and uh, I had a, a, a bill that was uh, referred, or the issue actually is going to be referred to the Joint Transportation Accountability Commission to look into the question of whether that tolling is actually reducing congestion mm -hmm. as much as possible, whether those prices are set correctly uh, so that we get the maximum bang for, for the toll buck. Now, I take it there are some anomalies that, that can occur. For example, about a month ago, I believe, there was a salt truck on Interstate 95 in the hot lanes, mm -hmm. and it caused significant delays, and the, the toll prices went up significantly. I think that's being resolved now, but those things can happen as well, can they not? Yeah, and I think what happened there is the, is the toll pricing, the computer so-called algorithm, when it sees traffic back up, it thinks mm -hmm. it's because it's congestion, not because of it, it's an accident. And so that's something that, that I think is in the process of being fixed. Frankly, should have been fixed a long time ago. But uh, that, that's, that's something I think will, will not be an issue in the future. Now, uh, what about the uh, Silver Line? How is that going? Well, it's operating from, uh, from Reston uh, through Washington, D.C., uh, through the, the, uh, the, the uh, Metro Corps into Maryland. Uh, construction continues uh, out to Dulles Airport and then two stops beyond. And I think the, the, the so-called Phase 2 west of Reston will be finished uh, probably in early 2020, so probably three years from now is what the time frame is. So is that an important factor in terms of economic development? Uh, it, it's certainly encouraging development in, in Tyson's Corner, Reston, and Herndon. The, uh, one of the issues with the Silver Line is that we went ahead and started construction on this. Actually, the plans go back several years. Uh, at the same time, what wasn't you know people in charge at the time weren't paying attention to are the safety concerns and the, and the existing infrastructure in Metro. And, and frankly, uh, some of us had had said early on when the Silver Line decisions were being made, maybe we ought to postpone that and get the rest of the metro system working the way it needs to, otherwise we're going to have a problem. And unfortunately, we've had a problem. Uh, we've, now, we've had a, a, a number of safety concerns, as you know, and we've, we've had to, uh, or, the, the or the management team at Metro has gone on an accelerated basis to fix those, and, and I'm all for it. They're doing the right thing. It's been kind of painful. We've had uh, single tracking inconvenience in terms of numbers of trains and things like that, but the system's got to be safe, otherwise people aren't going to ride it. And as a matter of fact, uh, I believe you have some legislation dealing with the compact that uh, Virginia, Maryland, and the District of Columbia have to agree to w with regard to Metro funding. Well, and it does two things. Uh, one is it sets up a new interstate compact between Virginia, D.C., Maryland, and the federal government, uh, and we're required to do this by federal law to set up a safety oversight organization just for Metro and just for safety. Uh, so they're not going to assume the safety responsibilities from Metro. They will be an independent oversight and audit group and can point out things that need to be done to keep the system safe. So that's, that's kind of part A. Part B is we have fundamental problems with just the financing of Metro, with the way the, the, the board is operating, with, with uh, a number of issues related to its, its ongoing operation that suggests that in the long term it's just not sustainable in the way that it's presently organized. And so part B is to reform the existing 50-year Metro Compact so that Metro is, is sustainable and safe uh, for the long term. Now, uh, to what extent, if any, does the governor, whomever that may be, have a say in terms of those kinds of transportation issues relating to Metro? Well, he, uh, uh, I think there's a lot of bipartisan support on the Virginia side with the governor Secretary of Transportation, the business community, those of us in the legislature, both on the Republican and Democratic side, to reform this process. So uh, the role that, that he can play and that all of us can play is to, is to put some wind into the sail, so to speak, of this, of this reform uh, movement to, uh, to get Maryland and D.C. to the table to actually start negotiating these things. And that's the issue. It's not a lack of willingness, I think, mm -hmm. on anyone on the Virginia side, it's getting the other parties to the table to say this needs to be done, and it really needs to be done now. Now, what about the criteria that has been uh, set forth in Smart Choice, dealing with how the Commonwealth Transportation Board uh, divvies funds out uh, on a statewide basis? Sure, has worked. Uh, it's um, it's it's off to a good start. I, I think I would I would uh, characterize it that way. This is a, a concept that we started in Northern Virginia almost five years ago now where we said, let's see if we can take as much of the politics out of these questions of where projects get funded. It shouldn't go to who's chairing what committee or who's got some kind of pull one way or another. 
uh, but let's evaluate projects in Northern Virginia in particular based on how much congestion a particular project will eliminate relative to the cost of the project. And this Northern Virginia Transportation Authority and this forthcoming plan is aiming to do exactly that. Uh, then we took the initiative statewide. Now, congestion's not a problem everywhere in Virginia, but there are other factors. Safety can be a factor, economic development can be a factor, uh, and so there are different factors in the other uh, uh, transportation districts around the state. But again, the principle is the same. Let's fund transportation projects based on merit, not on some political inside deal. Uh, and there'll be some, some adjustments that'll need mm -hmm. to be made you know, as we go along and we learn how this process works. But uh, overall, overall, I think we're off to a good start. Now, how important a factor is return on the state's investment? Well, that's, uh, yeah, ROI, as they say in the business community, is, is a big deal. And that's exactly what, what we're looking at. So in, in Northern Virginia, uh, the ROI is computed based on how many more people can move and, mm -hmm. and the mobility, generally, of, uh, of the region. Uh, not just on, on highways, but the combined transit, buses, and, and rail is all, is all part of that equation. Now, in southwest Virginia, where economic development is, is a significant concern, the question is if we build a certain road or we connect interstate highways that may be coming from North Carolina or, uh, or West Virginia, how does that improve our economy? So that rate of re return on investment is computed based on that metric. Uh, Another huge economic driver, which does have an indirect economic impact on your district in Northern Virginia, is the Port of Virginia. Uh, what's happening there? Are those post-Panamax ships now coming into that port? I'm told they are, and that's, that's really exciting. So the, the Panama Canal, of course, has been widened, uh, and so that's a, a huge opportunity for uh, shipping business on the east coast of the United States. doesn't affect the west coast much. Most, you know, Long Beach is the big port on the west coast. Uh, but rather than, you know, drop cargo in Long Beach and then send it across the country by train wherever it might need to go, with the wider canal, these uh, huge ships can come up to uh, ports on the East Coast, and it's been Virginia's initiative now for several years to make sure that, that our port is the most competitive and that we get that business. And it looks like that's off to a good start as well. And I think there are continuing investments in, in that port. I think last year there was an investment of about $350 million, I believe. Sure. And it's, no, and it's, it's uh, again, return on investment's important here. And the, the jobs that that creates, uh, not just at the port, but the, for the transportation infrastructure, the fact that uh, goods can be uh, shipped uh, at a, a less costly basis. And so the consumers, whatever they might be buying, whether it's a, an automobile or whether it's some consumer product, uh, that comes from overseas can get a better price. And of course, rail is important in that regard. I understand that uh, rail uh, contributes to the distribution of uh, goods from the port up to the inland port in Front Royal, for sure. example. And that's only a couple hundred miles of, uh, of uh, transport, and so the cost on that is significantly less than going two or 3,000 miles from the West Coast, which is what a lot of these uh, uh, containers off these ships have, have been doing. And I think that there was an attempt this session, it, it, it may not go anywhere this year, to create a port in uh, southwest Southside, Virginia, I believe. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that, but that's uh, for some of the, this inland port idea makes, makes sense as well in terms of customs fees and just uh, centrally locating along railroads, things like that. So. Now, back to the Commonwealth Transportation Board, uh, some people have complained about lack of transparency, but, but I understand that uh, Aubrey Lane now has indicated that uh, citizens will be able to view online by way of streaming the meetings of the Commonwealth Transportation Board. Well, and you're seeing that uh, uh, more and more throughout uh, just the operation of government, and it's, and it's a good thing. I mean, our, our floor sessions in the House of Delegates have been streamed online for uh, uh, several years now, but with the uh, uh, you know, low expense of, of cameras and you, know, you can just put an iPhone on a tripod and turn it on and, and stream just about anything. And I know there's a group that's been doing that for our committee and subcommittee meetings so everybody can see what we're up to. Uh, you shouldn't have to take a, a trip to Richmond just to sit there and watch. I mean, it's great that people do that, uh, but if they could do it from their home or somewhere else, why not? And as a result of your membership of the uh, on the General Laws Committee, I think you have a number of initiatives uh, uh, regarding transparency, especially Freedom of Information Act uh, uh, issues. Sure. And I actually uh, chair the subcommittee that's responsible for those issues uh, on the General Laws Committee. 
And then uh, the rest of the year, I actually chair a, an independent uh, citizen-led advisory council called the Freedom of Information Act Advisory Council. And I say citizen-led because there's 12 members. Only two of us are legislators. Uh, and everyone else comes from either uh, represents a local government or uh, the news media that, of course, has an interest or, or others. I think the attorney general has an appointee. The governor has an appointee. Uh, and what we've done, uh, and the reason why I have a number of these bills this year, is we've undertaken a, a, a more than two-year effort to scrub our Freedom of Information Act laws uh, to make sure they're up to date and to make sure that, that to the greatest extent possible, information is easily and readily available to the public. Uh, and we've made a number of changes uh, uh, in, the, in the law. Uh, I expect those bills will actually pass uh, today. Uh, two in particular, one's related to access to records and the other is related to access to public meetings. Uh, now, there's, there's some folks who have said we didn't go far enough. We should have, uh, there should be uh, fewer exemptions than, than what we're leaving. One of the things that we, we certainly came to my attention, maybe more than I appreciated at the start of the, of the project, was that our Freedom of Information Act law is very much also a privacy law for citizens of Virginia. So it's what we really want to make sure citizens have access to is government-generated information. And people can see those records, they can go to the meetings, they can see what's going on. But the government also collects a lot of information from private citizens to comply with the law. Tax returns would be you know, pretty high on that list. Uh, if you're doing business with the state, you may have proprietary financial information or trade secrets that you need to show to the state to get a contract of, of one kind or another. That should be kept private. And so most of what's in our Freedom of Information Act is our provisions keeping private information of, of Virginia citizens private. And we did not change any of that uh, in any way. I guess other examples of that, for example, uh, relate to discussions uh, about personnel matters, a, a local school board, board of supervisors. Uh, that's not subject to o open disclosure in, in terms of any open meeting that those local boards may have. Yeah, for, for personnel matters, there can be closed meetings uh, for, for certain personnel records. I mean, we, we can find, citizens can find out the name of every public employee, what they do, what they're paid. Uh, they don't get a copy of their performance evaluation year to year. And, you know, and there's, a, there's, there's not an exact line to draw there. I mean, some folks would say, well, we ought to share more, others we ought to share less. The consideration related to public employees, whether it's state employees, local government, teachers, of course, are the largest you know, set of local government employees, is if, if too much of that information can be made public, these people just aren't going to want to work for local government. They'll go do something else. It's, I, don't, I don't need to see my performance evaluation on the Internet or in the local paper. And if that's the way you're going to treat me, I'll go take a job in some other occupation. So we need to keep in mind that we want to attract good people at all levels of government, particularly teachers. And so while the public has a right to know who these folks are and what they're paid, they don't have a right to know every little detail uh, about their performance in a classroom. That's between the teacher, the principal, and a few others. Uh, discussions of legal matters is, is another exemption. I think there was an issue here in the General Assembly a couple of years ago regarding communications between members of the General Assembly and the Legislative Information Service, especially as that related to legal matters. And what, we've, what we say in the, in the Freedom of Information Act is if it's related to a pending or anticipated lawsuit or other legal action against uh, one public body, state or local, uh, then you can have a private uh, conversation about that because you don't want the uh, other side, the opposition who's suing you, right. to, to know what you're planning. Uh, but, but it's pretty narrowly construed. So if it's just a legal question generally, you know, how do we interpret this law so that a local town council can follow the law, that's not uh, subject to a closed meeting. That's, that's all open. And you mentioned that uh, today you have a, a number of bills that uh, you hope will pass uh, the House of Representatives, uh, the, the House of Delegates. Why is that important? What significance does this day have? Well, today is, uh, is what we call crossover day, so it's the day that by which uh, all House bills need to pass the House, all Senate bills need to pass the Senate if they, are continue, if they will continue through the legislative process and, and make it to the governor's desk and be signed into law if he chooses to sign the bill. Uh, 
you know, in, in my case, the, the three categories, and we've talked about one, the Freedom of Information Act, but the other two that, that most of my bills are focused on are improving education and improving transportation uh, in Northern Virginia. Because when I go to the town hall meetings or I, or I take the citizen surveys, uh, by far, those are the three issues that come up more than anything else. And so it's when I knock on doors and, and otherwise receive email, when you sum all that up, there's not a lot of ambiguity about what the people think my job description should be, and I stick to it. Uh, talk to us about some of the education-related uh, initiatives that will be on the floor today that you are pursuing. Well, one uh, that's uh, actually a continuation of, uh, of a bill uh, I had last year is to get rid of, of uh, red tape in the education system. Uh, it's not something that's particularly glamorous. It's not going to make the front page of the newspapers. Uh, but uh, one of the things that, that I've learned in being involved in the education process and, and working with the local schools and our, and our school divisions in Northern Virginia is that teachers spend an awful, amount of t awful lot of time uh, filling out paperwork that goes into some report that gets rolled up into something that gets sent to either Richmond or Washington to in some way, shape, or form prove that we're educating children. And so I asked uh, over the course of time, this goes back two or three years, well, can I get a list of these reports? I'd just like to know how many there are. No one can answer the question. So I had a bill last year that said that the annual report that's already done by the State Board of Education to the General Assembly needs to have an appendix, and you shall list all these reports that school divisions send to Richmond or to Washington. And they did that. It came out just uh, in December. And I was horrified to find 151. 151. 151 reports are due to Washington or Richmond uh, from our local school divisions. And, and so I said, well, okay, let's, let's take the next step. So I put in a bill this year that said, you need to justify why we need all these reports. Now, it may be that the State Board of Education isn't asking. It may be that they're required in federal law or they're even required in state law. But if that's true, at least tell us if these are useful, whether anyone's reading them. Mm -hmm. And if not, we can introduce legislation to get rid of things that aren't useful or combine them into other reports or make them less frequent. The whole idea is to, is to get rid of the paperwork churn. We certainly need transparency and accountability on our education system. We need to have metrics so we can know what's going well, what's not, what school divisions are, are struggling. That's all really important, but at some point, the nth plus one report doesn't really tell you anything you didn't already know. And that's what we want to we wanna get at so teachers can spend more time teaching and less time filling out paperwork. Uh, speaking about uh, more time teaching, I know that the standards of learning reform have, have been put into place at least through K through 8. Where are we uh, at, at the high school level in, in that regard? Well, the, the, uh, we had legislation last year that said let's take a top to bottom review of, of high school education. Uh, it's been referred to as high school redesign. Uh, and that has, uh, you know, in the process of being implemented by the state board. Uh, what uh, there seems to be a consensus, and we'll see if it actually ends up in, in uh, the state law this year, uh, that the number of SOL tests to graduate from high school should be reduced to five. And they would be in the subject areas of uh, English, writing, math, science, and social studies. Uh, today, depending upon the type of diploma, a standard diploma, there's six, and an advanced diploma, there's nine. And there's a range of classes that require SOL tests. Algebra one, geometry, and algebra two all have an SOL test. So if, even if you don't need to take one to graduate, you need to take the test if you take the class. Right. So that's the kind of streamlining that, that we want to do. And, and, and I think in my view, uh, you know, state law ought to have the minimum requirement. Uh, and, and we all say that it, not just because folks on the state board said so, but the elect elected representatives of the people say, this is what a Virginia diploma means, and we can point to it in the law. The other factors of the questions on the tests, how frequently they're administered, how all that goes, we really need to leave that up to the Department of Education and the state board to, to figure out those details. What about the emphasis on uh, dual enrollment between our high schools and our uh, uh, community colleges? That's, that's a continuing uh, success story, and, and we, uh, we continue to promote that. There's some, some legislation this year to make some what I would generally consider to be minor adjustments, but uh, if there's a student who's doing well and, and wants to take an advanced class that's not offered at the high school but is offered at a a community college or, or even a, one of our public universities, you know, why hold that student back? 
uh, let them let them go to that class if their schedule allows and, and continue to advance uh, to the best of their ability. So that just makes a great sense. And what about more choice for parents and, 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 and their students in terms of charter schools, for example? Education savings accounts, I think there's a bill uh, making its way through the General Assembly on that. Yeah, there's, there's a number of initiatives on school choice. We had the charter uh, bill last year. Uh, we, didn't, we had the votes in the House, not the Senate. Uh, I think a, a number of people were concerned that, the, that that would allow the state to step in in a, in a very heavy-handed, big way and say, well, you know, even though there's 134 school divisions around the state, most of you are doing fine, we're going to show up and say, you know, we're here from Richmond and we're here to help you. And that's not what people want. And it's not what, what I want or, or anyone else wants. The concern is we have a relatively small percentage of schools that are really struggling. And over the course of time, it doesn't look like their localities are in a position to really turn things around. And so when you have those kind of exceptions, not the rule, then the question is, what should be the role of the state in stepping in? And it turns out most states around the country have that authority in that case. In Virginia, the state government doesn't. And so that was uh, really the, 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 the focus of the issue with charter schools. If that issue comes back, perhaps there's a way to more narrowly construct it so we're only talking about helping schools that are really struggling and not just stepping into Fairfax or Loudoun County and saying, hey, we've got a bright idea here and you guys need to go along with it. That's not what we're talking about. Got about a minute left, believe it or not. Sure. But, uh, you know, you're a high-tech guy. Uh, you come from that uh, business expertise, so to speak. Cybersecurity is, is a burgeoning industry where high school students with a certificate can uh, earn, earn a pretty good salary. And it's, it's uh, one of the biggest cybersecurity issues that hasn't made the news yet is transportation because we've got uh, these uh, autonomous vehicles or semi-autonomous vehicles that will be coming out where the, 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 you don't even need a driver someday in the future, but some of those processes are automated. All that takes is a lot of electronic sensors on highways, and if, if those aren't secure, uh, even at a red light, if, if some bad guy gets into the system and says, let's just turn all the, all the lights red, right. okay, all of a sudden everything's ground to a halt. Or the opposite problem, let's turn them all green. <laughs> you got another problem. So there's a real, I've looked at cybersecurity mostly from a transportation standpoint, and the, and the VDOT team in Northern Virginia actually walked me through some of the work they're doing. But there are, there are significant job opportunities in cybersecurity at all levels of, of education for, for people, whether they've come out of community college, a high school, uh, or a four-year or advanced degree. The other thing I'll mention is that we have so much construction going on in Northern Virginia right now, transportation, we have 2,000 unfilled construction jobs. Oh, so great. if anyone knows uh, someone who's looking for work in that, that uh, uh, field, I'd be happy to talk to them, give them a referral. Great. Well, thank you for being here, Delegate Jim Lemonian. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you for watching Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association. Until next time, I'm Woody Evans. Thank you. That was good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.